an amazing pleasure to be here with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, to be in the studio. It's just exhilarating and exciting. Lars reached out to me and I'm so excited to be able to be a part of this um, preparation of oil and water, such an important topic um, for the troupe to take up, and such a brilliant idea to have community forums um, in the development of the performance as we move to production. So really great to be a part of this. And oil is a topic to which I have committed my um, professional and journalistic and analyst and activist career. And the reason why is I started off as a very um, bright-eyed and idealistic legislative assistant working for the United States Congress and went there thinking that that's how I was going to help um, make things work better and kept bumping my head into one really big obstacle which I came to identify as the power of corporations and it doesn't take long when you start looking at corporate power and its control over government to <coughs> turn very quickly to oil corporations because they are and have been particularly after a brief lapse in the modern era, the most profitable and most wealthy, and I would argue most politically dominant um, industry and set of corporations in the United States and in many ways the world. So they have taken up uh, much of my time and energy. Um, and that's taken the shape of a couple different activities, one of which has been writing books. And one of the reasons why I wrote my second book, The Tyranny of Oil, is that I realized there really hadn't been a um, really in-depth critique of the oil industry to help us really understand the way it operates since The Seven Sisters was written in the 1970s. And we had had a real lapse of um, good um, diagnostics to help guide how we understand the industry and what we do to take on the industry and its power. So I titled the book The Tyranny of Oil the world's most powerful industry and what we must do to stop it. Um, because I got the first words from a speech delivered by then the first African American to win a major primary for the race for president in the United States, and that was Barack Obama. And when he won the Iowa caucus, he gave a speech in which he said, I will end the tyranny of oil. <laughs> and in the same breath, the next breath was, and the war in Iraq. As a candidate, he was immediately linking the two, which I thought was fantastic, and pledging to do something about them. He definitely did something about the latter and has been unable to do something about the former. But what I want to talk about tonight, and we'll certainly end up talking about, I imagine, Barack Obama some, is to, one of the things I also always talk about in my books is, um, Activism with analysis, the two go hand in hand. And that's how we create change, by really understanding the thing that we're looking at, figuring out how to create um, obstacles, alternatives, and change. And the good thing about the oil industry, in some ways, is that we have a very long history with it in the United States. And in fact, we have an incredibly inspirational history with it in the United States. In many ways, the populist or progressive movement, however you want to frame it, was earned some of its greatest credentials and power and heft in tackling what was then the biggest corporation in the United States and the world, which was Standard Oil. So I want to start with a quote that helps put this a little bit into historical perspective. And this is from President Grover Cleveland in 1888. And he said, Corporations which should be carefully restrained creatures of the law and servants of the people are fast becoming the people's masters. <laughs> and then a quote by John D. Rockefeller, who was Mr. Standard Oil. the founder of Standard Oil. I have ways of making money that you know nothing of. <laughs> <laughs> and then this, to put some of this into context of where we have been and where we're going. In 1938, King Abdul Aziz of Saudi Arabia asked, Do you know what they will find when they reach Mars? They will find Americans in the desert searching for oil. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans that Aziz was talking about in 1938 was Standard Oil of California, which is today, anybody know? Chevron, Chevron Oil Company. 
And while Chevron's employees are not yet today busy searching for oil on Mars, they are just as committed to finding and acquiring every last drop of oil as they were 70 years ago. They're working to expand access to oil in traditional areas, such as Iran and Iraq, while seeking out new frontiers below the ocean floor, the top of the Rocky Mountains and the depths of the tar-filled earth. In mid-2007, this is three years before the BP oil spill, Chevron's Paul Siegel stood 200 feet in the air atop Chevron's Cajun Express. It's a floating oil derrick, which was 190 miles off the coast of Florida. And he's looking out on the Gulf of Mexico. And he says, quote, a decade ago, I never even dreamed we'd get here, he said, looking out across the Gulf waters. And a decade from now, this moonscape could be populated with rigs as far as the eye can see. <laughs> very, very inspirational. And a vision of the future. You call it a moonscape in the middle of the water? Yes. Now, Rockefeller started Standard Oil in the 1870s and built Standard Oil to be the quintessential corporate power of its time, the largest, most powerful corporation. It was dominant in the market for oil, for, for refining oil, for producing it, and for creating kerosene, which is what it was used for at the time. This was pre automobiles, of course. This was an era post the Civil War where corporations were heavily protected by the US government, by laws, protected from competition from smaller companies, protected from uh, foreign competitors, from domestic com competitors. They were coddled, they were given subsidies, and they were allowed to merge into mega conglomerates. And the consolidation of that power created these massive corporate trusts, the biggest and most powerful of which was Standard Oil. A cartoon from the era depicts it well and might sound familiar. So it's a cartoon from about 1870 or 1880, probably more 1880, 1890. And it's um, the U.S. Senate seated just like you guys are. And it's the United States Senate and there's men sitting there. And behind them are these huge fat cats depicting the corporate trust towering above them in top hat and tails. And of the corporate trust, the only one that's identified by name is Standard Oil. Written above the cartoon is, we are the United States Senate, of the monopolists, by the monopolists, for the monopolists. And then in the corner is a teeny little door marked People's Entrance, which is locked and bolted and kept shut. Now in response to this corporate power, we had one of the most active periods of activism in US history literally thousands of strikes involving hundreds of thousands, if not half a million people a year, people from all walks of life. They were striking, they were protesting, they were calling for policy change, they were calling for revolutionary change, they were acting in the streets, they were protesting in the streets, they were doing everything they could to create change. And a quote from that era from one of my favorite parts, and the people involved was every group of people you can think, including journalists, and they were called muckrackers at the time. My favorite of whom was a young woman named Ida Tarbell. <laughs> and Ida Tarbell wrote, the 1880s dripped with blood. Men struggled to get at causes, to find corrections, to humanize and socialize the country. For then as now, there were those who dreamed of a good world, although at times it seemed to them to be going mad. John D. Rockefeller said at the same time, the way to make money is to buy when blood is running in the streets. In response to all this activism, there were radical changes, which don't seem particularly radical at the time. The first changes to actually rein in corporate power in US history. Radical things like the right to unionize, the eight hour workday, the 40 hour work week, prohibitions against child labor, the very first campaign finance laws in US history, and in some cases, for many years, one of the most important achievements of the time, antitrust law. The focus of antitrust law and the, the idea was that if corporations get so big that the public cannot control them, that is contrary to the functioning of our democracy. It is contrary to the idea of an economy 
that is built more on small business and manageable size, and certainly contrary to the idea that the government should be able to regulate corporate activity. And so antitrust law was built to break up the trusts, the most powerful being Standard Oil. So through protests and action, laws, um, lawsuits, ultimately all of this action resulted in the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911 into 34 separate corporate parts. What happened was really starting, and I'm just going to skip a huge amount of history, starting in the 1980s, the idea that corporations should be regulated, or really that anybody should be regulated, the idea that corporations should be kept manageable, the idea that the government should exercise control over most anything, was erased in the Reagan administration, which took on a full frontal attack on antitrust law and regulation in general, and that attack continued through each successive administration. The, what happened when antitrust law was eliminated, not eliminated, but eviscerated in its influence, was that all of these mega mergers started happening, and we saw all of these pieces that had been separated start merging together, like if people have seen Terminator mm -hmm. 2, there's the liquid <laughs> guy, you kill him and he breaks up and then his pieces slowly merge together and he comes back to attack you. So there were 34 separate corporate oil parts, the breakup of Standard Oil. The largest post-breakup piece, Standard Oil of New York, does anyone know what company that is? Exxon. The second largest post-breakup piece, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Mobile. The third largest post-breakup piece, Standard Oil of Indiana, what is now BP. The fourth, Standard Oil of California, Chevron, you name it, what we've got are the, the former break, broken up pieces of Standard Oil allowed to merge, including the two largest post-breakup pieces, Exxon and Mobil, allowed to merge to become the world's largest corporation. What a shock, Exxon, Mobil. Chevron was allowed to merge with Texaco. Chevron had already bought Gulf. Texaco had already bought Getty. They combined and they bought Unical. They kept buying more companies. That's all Chevron. BP purchased Amoco and Arco, which is how it became so big and entered into the United States. Conoco and Phillips merged. I'm forgetting all the different mergers. But basically, we created, allowed these behemoths to come back together. By the way, the exact same thing happened in the banking sector. Small pieces were allowed to merge together into mega banks. With the oil industry, those mega mergers added to oil created hands down the most profitable industry the world has literally ever known. So in 2003, ExxonMobil earned the highest profits of any corporation in world history ever, period, adjusted for inflation. It topped them in 2004, it topped them in 2005, it topped them in 2006, it topped them in 2007. The economic crash, which the oil industry helped create, which we can talk about later if people want, did impact them as well. Basically, they pushed oil, they helped push oil to over $100 a barrel. The world economy cannot handle $100 barrel oil. The shock helped fuel the economic collapse. That impacted the oil industry for about a year. That's it. They had a few profits on which to ride, so it didn't hurt too bad, and they've come back since. I focus on profit as a measure of power because what I'm concerned about is what they do with that dramatic excess wealth in comparison to what everybody else has. And what they do with it is they impact public policy to their benefit. The Bush administration was the quintessential version of this. Really for the first time, the oil industry was completely able to stop worrying about lobbying and just start legislating. George Bush, Junior was only the second American president in history to come out of the oil industry. Does anyone know who the first one was? Bush one. Bush one. George Bush Senior. <laughs> George Bush, Cheney, Rice, all former oil company executives or policymakers. Rice had been the head of the policy committee on the board of Chevron. She had an oil tanker named after her, the Condoleezza. Very much part and parcel to this industry and continued that activity uh, within office. And they were just the top of what was really an oil government. And what that government did was eliminate barriers. At the same time as we've got, and this, none of this was by coincidence, right? So the oil industry spent more money than it's ever spent on any election in history in 2000 to get Bush and Cheney into office. 
the only time they topped it, and this is again getting back to the positive story, which I'm definitely going to end on, was in 2008. And believe me, they did not put their money behind Obama. They put their money behind McCain and Palin, and they lost because they don't always get what they want, even though they have more money than anybody. And it's a very good example of how they can be beaten, and they are often beaten. Um, but they got their oil government for eight years, and they ran with it. This was happening at the same time as a sort of new realization gripping the world of something known as peak oil. And this concern that the world was consuming an enormous amount of oil, more than we were finding, and that we're going to run out, and we better get ready for the time that we're going to run out. And a lot of environmentalists and activists spoke a lot about the concern about peak oil. That was important, but the problem was, and I was concerned about it for a good period of time, was that people heard the argument. And how did they respond on the whole? By saying, oh shit, we better let the oil companies get as much oil as they can get because that post-peak oil world sounds really crazy. And so we did. We have opened the floodgates and let the oil industry go to places that were never deemed acceptable or accessible before. And deep offshore drilling is one of those. Believe me, I spent two years covering the Gulf oil spill on the ground, embedded within communities most impacted by the spill. What is clear from everyone in the industry is that the oil industry actually does not have the technological capacity to do what they're doing. They, what they do have is the money and the will. There's a lot of oil out there. They'll be able to push back the peak really far if we let them go after it. And guess what? We're letting them. And they're going out to insane depths. And that is a frontier that we've allowed them full, unfettered access to. Another frontier which we've allowed them full, unfettered access to is the tar sand region of Canada, which should, like offshore drilling in my mind, be simply off limits given the way that the operations have to move forward to get the oil out of the ground. And it's not oil, it's called tar sands because it's tar and sand. To get it, to get at this material, they built the largest dumpsters the world has ever known. They cost $5 million a piece. They're, it, t it takes um, 18 steps to get into the driver's seat. So I have a quote from one of the drivers who says, it takes me 18 steps to get from my downstairs to my upstairs to my bedroom. So basically I'm going upstairs to my bedroom and driving my bedroom around downtown. They can, they are, I don't have the numbers in my head. They're enormous machines because you have to dig up so much earth and then mix it with so much water to get just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of bitumen that can then eventually be broken down into a very, very dirty, um, hardly deserving the name of oil that then needs to be moved in this form. So one of the things that we're seeing is more and more and more oils coming out of the tar sands, right? And it's being moved on trains and it's being moved in pipes. <clears throat> we just had this huge oil spill in uh, Mayflower. Mayflower. Um, Arkansas. <laughs> Sorry, I've been thinking about Afghanistan all day, so I was about to say <laughs> Afghanistan. We did have an oil spill in Afghanistan, but not this one. Um, Arkansas. And one of the reasons why this spill happened is because we're moving more and more product from Canada, but we're using the same old pipes, and these are old pipes. Old pipes is the name of the game for this industry. They don't spend any money. They have the, they're the richest industry in the world, but they don't spend any money on stuff they don't have to until they're forced to. So the Richmond refinery explosion that happened a year ago, does anyone know the cause of that yes. explosion? Yeah. Um, high sulfur oil, well, uh, back up a little bit. Go on the site of the uh, Chemical Safety Board, which just had a meeting in Richmond. Mm -hmm. They have a great little video of exactly how the fire happened. They're fantastic. And uh, the pipe, uh, to make a long story short, the pipe had deteriorated to dying thickness uh, before it crashed. Corroded, 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 so that there's only this much room left. Now, how long does it take to corrode to that level? Well, it took two, 30 years. 30 years. Uh, 30 years. In 2002, their own metallurgist said, replace it. So they already knew. 
and for 30 years essentially they used old pipes. Now that might have been acceptable had there not been three major explosions at the refinery already, just over the last several years, for, for what cause? Old corroded pipes. Again, remember, this is the wealthiest industry the world has ever known. This is the United States. Now, this is the United States. This is Richmond, which is Chevron's backyard. Richmond was their first refinery in the United States. Their second refinery is in El Segundo, California. Guess how it got its name? Chevron's second refinery. Oh. El Segundo is the community. Yeah. And they still run them on a hair string. The same happened in Mayflower. This was an old pipe built for a completely different type of oil. The oil coming out of Canada is um, mixed with an acid to make it flow because it's this thick vitamin thing. And to make it flow, it's mixed with an acid. Guess what the acid does? Eat away at the pipe. And so we can expect, and this is a heavily, heavily unregulated sector pipelines. Nobody pays attention to them. Hopefully we're going to start paying attention to them now. Um, the other way that they're moving the tar sand product is by rail. Guess what? The more that they're moving by rail, the more derailments there are, the more the stuff is spilling off of trains. What they really want to do is build more pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline. That is taking the same dangerous, acidic, thick product and just carrying it in a much higher quantity in a much greater distance. It would be new pipe, which is nice, but still a completely unregulated sector. So using as little regulation as possible to move more and more and more product. We have them also moving into natural gas production, obviously fracking, a uh, huge problem. We also have them going after whatever sources of oil they can to whatever end they can. And in that we have them creating governments that will fight wars to get their product. The Iraq war had a lot of uh, motivations, but I argue very strenuously that one of the most prominent and significant was oil. In that position, I am, I share that position with people like General Avizad, who was the head of U.S. Central Command during the Iraq War, Alan Greenspan, um, I just wrote this whole, this is what I wrote for CNN.com, if you want to see this. This was uh, for the 10 year anniversary of the war, why the war in Iraq was a war for oil. CNN.com, they ran it on the front page of their website, 2,000 comments, 500 of which were, I can't believe it took CNN 10 years to write this piece, which means that the American public gets it. Took a while for major news outlets to get it. So wars, deep offshore drilling, fracking, tar sands, and by allowing them to move into all these areas and to reduce the restrictions on them while they do so, what we've allowed them to do is make oil continue to be more attractive for them and continue to be something that they can keep producing and to push out the peak. What that means is that even though the other thing that they're doing is trying to get us to believe that they're friendly green companies, right? Chevron's human energy campaign, it's We Agree campaign. The whole point of that isn't that you're going to suddenly be like, oh, gee, oil companies. Nobody likes oil companies. They never have. But what it will do is put a seed into your mind, which is, OK, it makes sense, right? Oil's going to run out. They're companies. They're practical. They know that they need to move into alternative energy. Otherwise, why would they? You know, they'd be, they'd be silly not to, right? And then you think, oh, if they're moving into alternative energy, if they care about AIDS in Africa, you know, maybe I don't need to worry about them, and maybe I can worry about all the other things I need to worry about. Not, I'm going to like them. They don't even care particularly if you go buy their gas. That's not where they make their money. They make their money from oil, oil, oil. What they want you to do is not be concerned about them, not try and regulate them, not try and restrict them, not try and build alternatives to them. <clears throat> move your energy as a concerned citizen elsewhere, because you've got plenty else to look at. But while you're looking over here, quick hand, right? They're over here, and believe me, they're taking well, well, well advantage of it. And we're also so, we're not, we're also, we're not only blinded by them, we're spooked by them, right? We're afraid, they're big, they're powerful, they're rich. 
The reality is we have, in fact, done it before. We've taken on this industry. We've broken it up into teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces. We've challenged its power. We challenged a lot of the basis on which it built its power. And it took about 100 years for it to rebuild, but it did. And it just means that we can do it again. But what that means is coordinated activism that is targeted at lots of things. One of which is there's a divestment campaign that 350.org is organizing built on similar models to the anti-apartheid movement, which is to get cities and states and institutions like colleges to divest from oil companies. The other is a campaign called the Separation of Oil and State, which a group called Oil Change International has organized. And that model is really based on very successful campaigns against the tobacco industry. They basically said to elected officials, a lot of you talk or really did talk about the oil industry, okay, don't take any money from them. If you won't take any money from them, we'll believe that you then won't do what they say. Senator Carl Levin is a really good person to pay attention to right now. He's been senator from Michigan forever. He's very powerful, he's been very powerful, and he finally got so fed up that he said, forget it, I'm not gonna run again so that I can spend two years actually being in office not having to get money, and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Guess who's running the Senate hearings right now that brought in Apple, accusing Apple of $44 billion of unpaid taxes? There's one guy sitting in the hearing, it's Senator Levin. All the rest of them are too afraid. And the reason why he's able to sit there and say Apple is because he's not running for office again. So the way that they are sacrificed to these dollars, separation of oil and state, is a very powerful way of getting at that. The other is ending their free ride. So billions and billions and billions of dollars in subsidies and tax breaks, all of those literally billions of dollars make it impossible for the alternatives to build. And the main alternative that I believe is the most important to support is public transportation, just moving ourselves out of automobiles altogether as much as possible and making it so that we're just simply not dependent on their resource as much as possible. And the other is, you know, we're not going to not use oil and gas overnight. It's just not going to happen. So it's while they are operating, actively regulating, restricting, reining in where they can go. If they can't operate without utterly destroying their environment, the climate, then it's not reasonable. If they actually don't have the technology to go somewhere, then it's not reasonable. Basically making different places out of their sphere and re-engaging in the concept of regulation of their activities. And what I would argue is, I don't want them invested in alternatives. I guess I didn't finish that story. They're not invested in alternatives. So they're all doubling down on oil. They have never invested very much in alternative energy and they're investing even less now. So at very, very best, and I go through all this in tyranny of oil, the very best company invested at the most 4% of its total capital and exploratory budget on a very broad category of alternative energy. That was BP, and that was in 2006, 4%. Now BP is utterly divested from alternative energy altogether. And what does BP stand for? Yeah. Beyond Petroleum. It was British Petroleum, but they changed it to Beyond Petroleum in 2001. They are now completely an oil company. Um, Shell basically divested from almost all of its alternative energy in 2008. Chevron does solar because they get a lot of tax credits for doing it from the Obama administration. When those tax credits end, I bet you pretty much Chevron's going to end at solar. But Chevron at its highest point was probably at about 3%. It's down to less than 2% now. Basically, they don't do alternative energy. They do it as a greenwash. Um, Spent a lot of money with NPR and PBS. Chevron in particular. Yep. Uh, if you've ever been to DC, there's an entire side of the PBS building that is draped in a huge Chevron advertisement. Yeah. Oh, it's so creepy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, again, again, I, like I said, I don't think that they have any, um, they're, not, they're not twisted to think that you're going to you know, really like them. But you're going to get that they're an industry that we need, they're doing the dirty business, someone's got to do it, and they're probably doing it in the best way or otherwise, why would they have ads about AIDS in Africa? They must have some good heart, right? That's what they want you to think. So that, okay, we'll just let them do it. And they've been very successful at that. In addition, on the alternative energy part, though, it's very important to point out, and I think most people know about this, 
there is an enormous amount of energy spent right on denying the reality of climate change, and there's been an enormous amount of money spent by Exxon on fueling the climate deniers movement, and the significance of that can't be under emphasized. They don't just sit idly by. They invest to make us believe things that are false. So um, a recent report just came out that showed 2,000 studies on climate. 97% of those studies, 97%, all agreed that climate change is real and it's human-induced. There were 3% of all the people in all the studies in all the world that were climate deniers. The success of what ExxonMobil pulled off was making us believe that there was a real debate among scientists. And so we were like, how, who are we to say? If the scientists don't agree, then clearly there's doubt. That wasn't ever the case. And they used their money to make us feel like we didn't know the answer, when in fact the scientists fully agreed. What that meant was that we wouldn't work for regulations to rein in the effects of climate change, and we didn't. And it works very well. Um, so challenging their misinformation is also very important. A whole other sector, which I won't even go into, um, is, is looking at price controls and regulations, just, just enough to say that the same way that the mortgage crisis um, was caused by deregulation in the financial sector and um, trading sectors, uh, you can look at the same root of the problem for the way that the price of oil is manipulated, and it's another good place to look for places where we can regulate. And then there just is an incredible amount of optimism, and this is where I will end. The United States reached its peak of oil consumption in 2008. We have not moved up since, we've moved down. At first, people thought it was just the economic crisis, and that Americans were using less because they didn't have as much money. The reality is that the numbers have stayed, and that when people are polled, it's that they are concerned about the use of oil. Americans in our car and transportation is that 70% of all the oil and gas we consume. We are still the major consumers in the world, hands down. Getting us out of our cars is an enormous shift, and Americans are doing it. They're choosing more fuel-efficient cars, they're driving less, and we are reducing, reducing consumption. And reducing consumption in the United States is one of the most powerful things we can do to rein in and reduce the power of the oil industry, and in fact, we are already doing it. So I guess I'll end there. Yeah. 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 as far as like trying to find the, the ways to approach all this stuff. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm really focused now on, on, on what it is about people in general that we've sort of accepted this status quo that, that oil is bad and it's killing us and oil companies are terrible and we accept that and, um, and, the, and that there's a feeling that that isn't going to change. Um, and then I guess more specifically, uh, one of one of our one of our major topics for the summer show is, is dealing with a Chevron, um, specifically the Ecuadorian lawsuit, um, and I really see that as just these sort of these examples of, of where if if we can just find a few of these places to really actually hold companies accountable and really do it all the way so that everyone can see it, so people see that they're not invincible. Um, that's I guess what I'm really sort of interested in. Sort of how that switch can turn with people so that we can imagine something better. And, and I guess I'm just really interested in hearing your thoughts on, on that, the Chevron lawsuit and all its many incarnations and where it's at. Supporting communities in Ecuador and teaming up and showing how it's the same struggle and supporting the government in Ecuador, the largest case against any corporation in world history, has been ruled. They've been found guilty. They owe $19 billion. Um, that's it. Are they paying him? No, they're not paying him. So, so they're not paying, <laughs> and so the struggle goes to making them pay. I'm interested um, in sort of having a discussion about 
this jobs versus um, the, the environment, and, and I don't think you have to pose them as, I, I just don't think you have to do that, but I work with uh, labor, and there's, um, labor approves some crazy stuff because of the short-term um, jobs, you know, people are, are you know, suffering. And, and you know, the jobs piece is obviously really important, and I think one of the, um, the oil industry doesn't hire many people. They hire less and less and less people. And it's not a good sort of long-term vision for job creation um, because they are getting more and more and more technical um, and use less and less physical people. Um, and most of their numbers for jobs are ridiculously inflated. Yeah, what they said about the pipeline was just bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. No, there are a couple of thousand jobs to build it, but <clears throat> I think the number of permanent jobs something like 27. Yeah, that's, that's difficult. Well, construction I doesn't mean, ever say they want permanent <clears throat> jobs because all, most construction is you work on something and then it's done. So they don't say well, we're permanent jobs, but even then, the amount that, to, yeah, it, it's... I think that was important for us to acknowledge. I work really closely um, with United Steelworkers, which is the union that represents oil workers in the United States. And um, these are good unionized, with benefits, good pay jobs. And there are so few unionized jobs in the United States, you can't just blow it off. You know, they're like the guys who work offshore in the Gulf, high school education, there aren't other jobs, they risk their life every day, they know it, and they bring home good pay for their families, and that's why they do it. Miles away. And, you know, so. But I think what has to happen is some sort of pull out revolution if things are ever going to really fully change. I don't really have faith in Senate or Congress, I have faith in the people rising up more than I have in Congress doing something for us. So I'm hopeful that, I hope it doesn't take too long, but I mean, obviously it's been happening for a long time and it, we haven't risen up yet. Occupy was like a little bit of a glimpse of what it could be, but I think it's gonna be a serious, it's gonna have to be something really serious. sort of that feeling generationally of like, oh, we're just so screwed. Mm -hmm. So like, what do we, what, you know, what, what can we do? Is it too late? And I think it's, where's the hope in that, like turning that around? Okay, we're really in a bad place, and we've known that we've been in a bad place since the 70s, and so like, so, so, now what? What are we, what are we going to do? How are we going to we have some ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's that's important to hear and to share. Yeah, it's Tesla uh, and these electric cars that are actually, um, I mean, Tesla specifically, it, it's uh, a beautiful car that uh, performs as well as any other car. And I have a Tesla Volt and I haven't driven a Tesla either. I got to sit in one this weekend, <laughs> which was pretty cool. It's only 60 grand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's it's great that um, that we're starting to offer alternatives that um, that we don't have to kind of compromise something um, that we can actually that that I think once we we're able to offer that um, that it will kind of uh, we won't be like a fringe group as environmentalists often are kind of categorized it will just be great I don't know. Car or, or just a, a lot of products that are that are starting to be offered that are, that really make sense, um, and I think that's something that I'm excited about. And there are problems with all of them. But. Oh, and forty percent of electric car owners have solar panels on their roofs. Hmm. Well, that's a good statistic. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Did everyone see how much Tesla just paid back? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. paid back their loans. Mm -hmm. How much mm -hmm. oil does it take to build an electric car? Yeah. They have their problems. <laughs> One is that I think people are becoming more conscious, at least in California and the Bay Area, about where their food is coming from, which is um, encouraging that you know people are trying to not buy food that's coming from China or coming from you know all other sides of the world. They're encouraged to buy more locally. And some grocery stores even say this fruit came from 50 miles away. 
how do I put this? Like the people who aren't doing that don't feel like, well, if I'm if I can't do that, then I can't do anything. Right. Or I'm just you know it just doesn't you know I'm just going to be part of the problem and we're all screwed and that's that, you know. And so um, so I like the idea of of pointing out the things that it just more and more people can just not be in this because everything just gets dichotomized all the time and it's either this or that and it needs to be this and this and this and this that's done you know over until the just the weight of of lots and lots of people in whatever way they can getting on board as opposed to just a few people doing extreme things and then everybody else feeling like well I'm not as hip and holy as you are so I guess I'm you know so um so for me, right now, I just definitely feel from hearing from, from you all about all these different ways that people... I think one of the most important things in this sector in particular, given the type of dramatic change that we do need, is um, collective action that makes it easier for people to make the right individual choices. So that's, for me, where public transportation is so important. Public policy changes that allow 100,000 people to go to work each day and make the right choice each day and get to work because the way they need to get to work and get to school and do the things they need to do and live their lives the way they need to live their lives. But because all of us have organized to say, we're gonna make sure that there's mass transportation and you don't have to be in your car, you get to make that individual action that has significant yeah. change. Coal companies, um, that's who we should be targeting. And I mean, this long list, you know, I mean, as bad as Apple and Google and all those people are, they do not have an intrinsic interest in using fossil fuels. Their, their corporate model doesn't require that. Yeah. And it's true of the insurance industry, which is paying out all this money for like things that just happened in Oklahoma. And the whole agricultural industry is being threatened by climate change. And, and things like tourism, and even, even the auto industry, which was like the worst, they were always allied with the oil companies, have now, they, they've agreed to go along with these higher uh, miles per gallon that Obama's implemented. And you know, I, I drive a Chevy Bolt. You know, it's a General Motors car, but they don't anymore require oil to keep their companies going. So there's a there's a, an important need to split the bourgeoisie, basically. I mean, there's the oil corporations, the fossil fuel companies, and there's the hundred percent. That's what I say. We're the hundred percent of the people that are going to die because of climate change. Right. And so, you know, we don't have to be enemies with you know people who we might not like at all. You know, like big corporations, but. If they are not oil companies, they don't have an interest in having their kids or their grandkids die. So, you know, I, I just think that's an important that point. That the EIR was to come up for, um, that would approve the expansion of the plant, a change in the plant so that they could refine high sulfur oil. Um, Chevron came to certain council members, which we now call the Chevron Five, <clears throat> and said, hey, we're going to give you all this money. All, we've got all this money for programs, and we're going to let you administer it. Well, uh, fortunately, that was tabled, and we got rid of them, uh, most of them. And so we're really happy about that. But they've come back, and in the last election, you may have heard, they chunked in more money than has been spent in any East Bay election by, what, by one donor. It was 1.2 million, and along with the million and a half from the beverage people over the soda tax. Because unfortunately, they, these companies, they not only buy their politicians, but they buy community groups by giving them money. And I, I, I did some um, of these, uh, what do you want to, we were just talking about the divestment going to our retirement system. Yeah. And well, we did Wells Fargo, and they had their folks coming out and these organizations that they give some money to. And you'd think that Wells Fargo was the most sweet, wonderful <laughs> company in the world, unless you see what they do to people. And it was, they just, you know, so they do buy, and they, they bought them in Richmond, too. Chevron buys a lot of organizations <laughs> in Richmond, um, and they <clears throat> brought them out whenever there's any kind of divestment stuff. So it's not only... Um, there's lots of nonprofits that, that, and they, you know, they get money and they're struggling, and that they go and and Wells Fargo or or a company says come and, and speak out and they do it. Term from the South, uh, Florida and Louisiana. Uh, I was there a few months ago, but Florida just 
couple weeks ago, and uh, my relatives were all from the Gulf Coast mm -hmm. somewhere or other. And so I keep up with that part of the country. And I mentioned Fox News, and it's very important in the South. It, they, it speaks their language, and they're really, it's, it's part of the culture, and they just go for it. They're just like, Sponge it up, and uh, <laughs> I'd like to keep that on the back on the burner of what should be done in the way of changing things in this country. Also, about Co the Koch brothers are now thinking of buying up yes. newspapers in this country. The Tribune oh, right, papers, yeah. Los Angeles so. Times, Chicago Tribune, and Portland. So. Changed. But that is a really interesting issue to bring up for the show. Is that's happening right now? The Koch brothers are the number one potential investor in buying the entire Tribune network of newspapers, mm -hmm. and um, it would be <clears throat> tragic, just a total horrible tragedy. I mean, it's be, it's Murdoch times a thousand. I would rather that Murdoch bought the Tribune companies than the Koch brothers buy the Tribune papers. Um, so that's a really interesting really new news piece that would good you could create some really interesting theater around because the Koch brothers are such caricatures of tyrants that <laughs> they would really lend themselves to theater. Yeah, that's pretty sure maybe too in terms of just getting people, you know, like Fox and, and the newspapers and all that sort of thing that people who pride themselves on reading the paper from cover to cover, you know, and it's in the paper so it must be true. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, it, I think that focusing, we need to focus on the on the oil, but we all we, we're always talking about the media, yeah. you know, in our in our plays. We're not really so far so much right this year, um, but it's true. It's like that's how people this mindset is yeah. shaped. Um, so an interesting piece would be the oil companies. One of the reasons why Chevron spends so much money on NPR um, and local newscasts is so that they won't do stories about them. Yeah. I mean, it's very direct, and I've I can't tell you who, but I have had leading mainstream media producers say to me, "We'd love to do that story, but we can't because Chevron's our major ad buyer." Yeah, yeah. I've and, never seen yeah. an NPR story that nailed Chevron. Never. It's pretty direct. I mean, so they they buy ads, and you don't want them to not buy ads. They also will sue, and you don't want to be sued. Um, well, those are the two big ones. They'll sue with a pull ad dollars. And so, you know, that's a really powerful tool that the companies do exercise over the media. Um, not completely, but it, it works. But the Koch brothers, the LA Times is one of the only progressive newspapers left in the country. And it, go, it tackles the oil industry. And if they bought it, you know, that's why they want to buy it. So it means that we do still have some good sources left, which is why they want to buy them. Um, and turn them into, you know, what the heck they become. Um, but that's an interesting piece. And the oil industry advertising would be an interesting thing, you know, to look at and that's relationship to control over the... I'd love to know, the like, the greenwashing that happens with Chevron ads and yeah. BP ads. They're all, they're, the, uh, Chevron's really aggressive in its advertising in the Bay Area in particular. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that does have to do with the case. Um, they really don't want people to spend too much time on the Ecuador case, for sure, because they really don't want to have to spend $19 billion. It's really pretty straightforward. Um, it's a lot of money even to them. Um, and again, it's, it's just, I, I really think that it's just this idea of, I've got a lot of else to worry about, I'm just not going to worry about these guys. Um, and I think the case is a lot of that, the Chef, I mean the Ecuador case. Yeah. Well, thank you Fun so much. Fun discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.